when Kepler stared at the darkness of the sky, he concluded that the universe was finite. After all, if the universe was infinite, then no matter what direction you look at, there should be a star in that direction. Well, little did he know that, in this same darkness of the sky, 20th century physicists would see, instead, the origin of the universe. Bear with me. First, I need to tell you about Formula One. You hear it? It's the Doppler effect. Consider the source of a repeating signal. If I'm not moving with respect to it, I'll hear the right frequency once per second. But let's now see what happens if the source is moving towards me. Do you hear it? When the source is coming towards me, the lars I hear are more frequent. To see why, notice that every la now has a different origin in space and you can see that signal fronts bunch up. Conversely, when the source is moving away from me, the lars I hear are less frequent. In terms of sound, lower frequencies corresponds to lower pitches and this means that the sounds from receding sources have lower pitches than the pitch at which they were emitted. This is the Doppler effect and the faster the source, the greater the Doppler effect. And that explains the familiar sound of the Formula 1. They're moving pretty fast so the Doppler effect is huge on them. In fact, we can use these Doppler effects to measure the speed of the car. The greater the Doppler effect, the faster the car. And in fact, it is the measurement of the Doppler effect of my car that once convinced this postman to give me a ticket. Now this phenomenon that applies to sound applies to light as well. But instead of the pitch getting lower, decreasing the frequency of light makes it redder. This is called the red shift. In the 1930s, Lemaitre and Hubble noticed that galaxies undergo such a red shift. In fact, the more distant galaxies were more red shifted than the closer galaxies. They undergo a stronger Doppler effect. So, they concluded that more distant galaxies are moving away from us faster. This is called the Hubble's law. In fact, Hubble's law says a bit more than that. It says that the speed at which a galaxy moves away from us is proportional to its distance from us. Crucially, by now turning the clock backwards, this implies that at some point in the distant past, all the matter in our universe was concentrated at a single point. In fact, by involving all at once thermodynamics, quantum mechanics, and general relativity, Lemaitre naturally concluded that our entire universe originated from a small, single quantum of energy, a primeval atom, a Big Bang. Naturally, everyone agreed with Lemaitre, right? Well, actually, no. Many of Lemaitre's contemporaries, including Hubble, agreed that just because the universe is expanding does not mean that it had an origin. Well, does that make any sense? I guess that philosophically speaking, a lot of the physicists back then really, really liked the idea of a static, eternal universe. But of course, there's another, more rational reason for the confusion. Hubble's law predicted that the entire universe had been expanding for 2 billion years. Which was very weird since, by that time, radiometric dating had concluded that the Earth was 4.5 billion years old. How could the universe be younger than the things that it contained? What's happening here? Is there some sort of gravitational time dilation that sort of slows the time here on Earth? Oh. Hubble's calculations were actually flawed, but no one knew it back then. 
That's why in 1948, when physicist Fred Hoyle noted that assuming a continuous but extremely rare spontaneous creation of matter, space-time could be expanding and invariant with time, he convinced a lot of people. After all, he had in his hands a static model of space-time that agreed both with Hubble's law, the age of the Earth, and all the observations that were available back then. So everyone believed in Hoyle, and everyone forgot about Lemaitre. However, new evidence for our Big Bang Theory were to come from a totally different part of physics. In the late 40s, nuclear physicists were baffled by the abundance of hydrogen and helium atoms in the universe, despite the lack of natural mechanisms to produce them. Alpha and others reckoned that the abundance of hydrogen and helium could be nicely explained if the whole universe had undergone a small, dense and energetic phase. It would be during this early phase that small atomic nuclei were massively produced. At that time, the universe would have been a hot and bright primordial soup. However, cosmologists argued that if that was the case, this primordial soup should still be visible in the sky. Yet, as far as they could see, the sky has been and still is black and Alpha's ideas got forgotten. Decades later, in 1965, Dicke and Peebles rediscovered Alpha's ideas. However, by then, technology had improved cosmologists' night vision, and thus, Dicke and Peebles hoped that they could actually see this primordial soup that their Big Bang Theory predicted, and they knew that if they did see it, they'd be making one of the greatest discoveries in the history of science. And that's when they received a phone call. Dicke listened, turned toward Peebles, and said, We've been scooped. By accident, radio astronomers Wilson and Pensias had detected what they thought was an overwhelming noise coming from all directions. But this noise was actually the bright primordial soup that Alpha had predicted decades earlier. Our sky is bright, wonderfully bright. But the huge expansion of the universe had produced a massive Doppler effect that redshifted the bright orange primordial soup and made it infrared. So infrared that we can no longer see it. Today, this very bright but extremely redshifted light is called the Cosmological Microwave Background, or CMB. And it is the conclusive evidence for the theory of the Big Bang. And I think it's pretty cool. Even though we can't see them, when you look at the darkness of the sky, our eyes capture photons that have crossed the entire universe just to give her an exclusive peek at the first moments of our space-time. Hey, so I hope you've enjoyed uh, this video. Uh, last week's comments were not uh, very plentiful, but I did get a first first! Woohoo! It is the first first on the channel, which I think is pretty cool. And there was even a first first reply to this first first! Woohoo! Now that was pretty cool, but I would love to have as well some more meaningful comments that I can reply to. So if you have any question, remark, or comment, please put them in the comments below. So, next time we're going to talk about gravitational time dilation. In part, you'll imagine you have a twin that stays on Earth and while you travel across the galaxy and then come back to Earth. Will you be younger or older than your twin? How does gravitational time dilation will kick in in this problem? This is what I want you to think about for next time. If you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, to share with your friends and to subscribe to the channel. And I hope I'll see you next time.